everybody, everybody that's here and uh, you watching me on the Facebook Live and YouTube. We're glad you're watching tonight. Kelly Price, good to have you watching tonight. And of course, my friend Dwight Cockrell down there in Puckett, Mississippi. Good to have you watching also. A lot of other folks, I think we have eight, ten people watching. So, so we'll, we'll, there'll be a few more come on here in just a minute. I will say this. For you folks that are not here and around Calico Rock, it's snowing here in Calico Rock. It is snowing. It is pouring snow here in Calico Rock. Of course, the temperature is a little above freezing, so it's not going to stick. But, uh, hey, it may get out low during the night, and we, if it keeps snowing, it will stick. So uh, we always love to see snow because being from Mississippi, we didn't, we didn't get a lot of snow in Mississippi, but... Uh, the first year we were here in 2008. 2008, remember we had a big snowstorm, ice storm, killed the power for a couple of weeks. And that's that was the first couple of weeks we were here in Caligo. So anyway, we've seen a lot of snow since then. We always love snow. Anyway, it's snowing here in Caligo Rock. Tonight we're going to start a new study. Remember I told you we're going to be looking at five chapters encouraging chapters during times of trouble, during times of stress. Uh, and so we live in a world today where if you are a Christian, you are beginning to see more and more trouble in our world today when it comes to spiritual things. I don't know if you watched television, but uh, I believe it was yesterday they had a Jericho march on the Capitol in Washington, D.C., they had a Jericho march. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who met there in Washington. They had a prayer service. They had singing and worship. And uh, Christians from all over the nation went to Washington, D.C. Uh, they called it the Jericho prayer march. And so in reference to the walls of Jericho coming down, and so that's what they were doing there. And last night I heard where a lot of those people who were at the Jericho March, when they were leaving the march, there were other there were people who who stabbed a couple of them, who beat up a couple of them. They were they were being perse persecuted on their way out of there, and so it was real sad to see that happening in the United States of America. But anyway, it's a sign of the times. It's a sign of the times. We're talking about five chapters that will encourage you as a Christian. And of course, we've already looked at a couple of the chapters. Tonight, we're going to start on the third chapter. Who remembers the two chapters we've looked at so far? What was the first chapter we looked at? Anybody remember? Before John. I'll give you a hint. Romans chapter I'll give you another hint. In this chapter, it says all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord. Chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 was our first chapter that we looked at. And then we turned our attention to John chapter 10. Kenneth, you said that, John chapter 10. And so that was our, our last week we ended that. This week we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, so if you have your Bibles, and I pray you do, please be turning there, 1 John chapter 3, small book toward the end of the New Testament, 1 John chapter 3. Tonight we're going to try to get through the first three verses. I'm not going to try to keep you a long time because of the snow and the roads and things, but uh We'll look at the first three verses of John chapter 3. And so while you're hunting or getting your place there in 1 John chapter 3, let's begin with a word of prayer, okay? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for the snow. Lord, thank you for these who've come out tonight, those who are watching. Lord, over the internet, we just pray a special blessing upon them. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, Lord, I pray that uh, I would rightly divide your word, the anointing would fall. Lord, that you would penetrate our hearts and encourage us with your word tonight. We love you, and Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
at all God's people said. Hey, man. Hey, Johnny, dear. Hey, Johnny, dear. Jackie, friend, I just texted you, check it on you. So uh, glad you're watching. Anyway, John, 1 John chapter 3. Let's read the first three verses. We'll try to get through those tonight. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God, exclamation point. Exclamation point, I was taught in school, means excitement, right? And this old Southern Baptist preacher, I like it when I see exclamation points because I like getting excited. So John here says, in other words, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Boy, he was excited about that. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, who is he talking about there? How do we know it's Jesus? Is the word he capitalized? The word he is capitalized, so it means divine. And so he is talking about Jesus there. But we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like him, capitalized again, talking about Jesus. For we shall see him, Jesus, as he, capitalized Jesus, is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, capitalized Jesus, meaning Jesus, he, just as he, Jesus, is pure. So let's stop right there and let's talk about this. First, I want to kind of give an introduction here about these three verses. In these three verses, we talk about, or the writer is talking about the love of God. The love of God. There is no greater subject in the entire universe, in all of the world, there's no greater subject than the love of God. Would you agree with me on that? Why is it such a wonderful subject? Well, let me tell you. Because if God loves us, if God loves me, it means that he's not far off. It means he's not in outer space somewhere that I can't get to him and he can't get to me. It means that God is not distant. It means that God is not unreachable. It means that God is not unconcerned with the world. It means that God is not mean or vengeful, that he does not cause all the bad things uh, to happen, the bad things that happen to us, such as accidents and diseases and death. The love of God means that God is not hovering over us looking for every mistake we make so he can punish us. Just on the contrary, when we talk about the love of God, God is love, my Bible tells me. That means everywhere you see the word love in the Bible, you can put God's name in there. And everywhere you see God's name, you can put love in there, amen. Amen. See, since God is love, it means that he's bound to show us his love and to act for us in love. Amen? It means that God cares for me and he looks after me. He looks after you and cares for you. It means that God will help us through our trials and our temptations 
It, mean God, it means that the love of God means that he's gonna save us from the sin and evil and corruption and death of this world. And God has provided a way because of his love. He has provided a way for us to be delivered from the coming judgment that we talked about this morning, that holy wrath against sin. But here's something else. If God loves us and has demonstrated his love to us, then he must expect a response. Because of his love toward us, he must expect a response. You say, Brother Kevin, what is that response? God has showed his love toward us. God expects us to love him. God expects you to love him. Oh, we proclaim God is love and he loves us and that's true 100%. But let me tell you something. I believe God expects us to love him in return. See, if someone loves us and we don't accept that love, we don't love in response then his love never actually touches us. Because if his love touches us, it changes us and calls us to respond to that love. If someone loves you and you don't accept that love, then actually you never accept the love that that person gives you. So God expects love in return. We're gonna talk about that. It's actually, it's, 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 it's right there in front of us in the first three verses. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So anyway, let's go to verse 1 and let's talk about it. That was just kind of an introduction. Took 15 minutes of our 30-minute time, but hey, anytime you can talk about how much God loves you, it's worth it, amen? Who praise the Lord. That's encouraging. That's encouraging to know that God loves us so much. So verse 1, we'll go back and reread it because... There's a couple of things I want to point out. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Right off the bat in the first verse of John, 1 John chapter 3, it talks about the love of God being bestowed on us and then it gives us the reason behind the statement that he makes in the very first part. He gives us in the second part the reason that he made the statement in the first part. And here's what I'm talking about. There is a great privilege of God's love. And he mentions it in verse one. See, the great privilege of God's love is that we're called his children. Amen. The great privilege of God's love is that we are called the children of God. Just think for just a minute how astounding this is that we in our current state could be called the children of God, the children of the man of the universe that created everything, that spoke it into existence, the great creator, the one that has all power in heaven and earth. I'm talking about God himself being called his child. What a great privilege it is, amen. What a great privilege. The supreme majesty of the universe the supreme intelligence and power that created all things. I believe there's no greater privilege one could have than that is to be called the child of the Most High. Would you agree with me on that, amen? Two things I want to talk about here. First of all, it's the love of God because of the love of God that this privilege has been stowed, bestowed upon us. And this privilege being called the children of God is actually because of an adoption. It's because of an adoption that has been placed upon us 
because I want you to know something. No man, woman, boy, or girl is a child of God because they merit that place up on his own. Because the fact is, my friend, mankind has rebelled against God. Man has chosen to go his own way in life and to do his own thing. He has wanted little, if anything, to do with God. He's not wanted the restraints of God upon his life. He has preferred to make his own way through life. Therefore, man has rebelled against God. Man has ignored God. Man has neglected God. Man has cursed God. Man has disobeyed God. Man has disbelieved God. Man has rejected God. Man has denied God. So it's nothing you and I have done within our own self that should give us the classification of being called children of God. Would you agree? it's a privilege you know this very thing is what makes the love of God so amazing this is what makes God's love so amazing because you say why you talk about that brother Cameron let me tell you because it's why we were rebellion in rebellion why we were rebelling against God why we were opposing God while we were sinners and enemies with God while we were standing against God while we were in wrath and in an enmity with God while we wanted little anything to do with God that's when God bestowed his love upon us that's what makes it so awesome you say are you sure about that well I'll just give you some scripture I love backing things up with scripture every preacher ought to back up his words with scripture he became backing up with scripture don't listen to him amen Romans 5 6 for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly Romans 5 8 but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? You say, well, what is all that love you're talking about? I'll tell you what, the ultimate love that God showed for us, that love is giving his son, his only begotten son, to come and sacrifice himself for the world. No greater love have man than this, that he, than he lay down his life for his friend. The greatest love that he showed us was sending Jesus, his son to die for our sins. We know that God loves us because he sent Jesus here. God didn't have to do that. God didn't have to do that. He could have just left us in our sin. He could have sent us, we could all, we were all headed to hell. He could have just let us alone and, and we would have ended up there. But he loved us and because he loved us, he's because he sent Jesus. That's how we know he loves us. He didn't want us to die in our sin. Amen? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? He didn't leave you alone. Amen? Aren't you glad? that he loved you so much. Come on now. Some of y'all ought to be shouting out there on Facebook, amen. I see amen, Jackie friend, you say it, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. My cousin down in uh, Texas, she always says praise the Lord, amen. She loves to, that's like saying sick them to a dog on a preacher, amen. But anyway, because of Jesus, God is now able to receive us not as sinners but he's able to receive us as righteousness. Not because of ourselves but because of Jesus as righteousness. Boy, I'm gonna tell you that's some shouting ground. God is able to accept us in his family. God is able to accept us in the family of God. He's able to adopt us as the children of God. He doesn't see us as sinners anymore. He sees us as the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If we will only accept what Jesus has done for us, if we will put our faith and make it a live faith instead of a dead faith, 
That's the difference, believers and unbelievers. The difference of believers and unbelievers, they all have faith. The Bible tells us he has given every man the measure of faith. Every person that's ever been born has been given the measure of faith. There's enough faith put in every person by the God Almighty that will allow them to be saved if they will only accept Jesus Christ. But there's a difference. Some people's faith is dead. Some people's faith is alive. The devil has faith, but his faith is dead. Dead faith will never accomplish you anything. You have to put your faith to work and make it a lively faith. I'll tell you what, everybody that was saved, you were saved through faith. God's grace, but it was your faith in that, that the, that's the reason you're saved tonight. You took that faith that God gave you and you made that faith become alive when you said, like this morning, our message, I'm a goat. I want you to make me a sheep, amen, and become my shepherd, amen. And there your faith become alive in Jesus Christ. Boy, we just got through the first part of verse one. I don't even think we're there really yet all the way. Look at the second part. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, the word of God says here that the world doesn't know or understand believers. The world doesn't understand believers. You know, what I talked about happened in Washington last night about people got beat up. I think there was two stabbings and so, so people stabbing the Christian folks and things of that nature. Now we know why Christians are mocked and ridiculed and persecuted by the world. The Bible says the world doesn't know you. The world doesn't know us. And it says because they didn't know him. And who was him? Jesus Christ. Remember the story? Jesus came and his own received him not. There even the religious folks didn't know him as the Messiah. Amen. The world doesn't know us. Remember they're spiritually blind. You've heard me say this many times. The problem is many times we as Christians expect the unbelievers to act like believers. Folks, unbelievers are not going to act like believers because they're lost. They're spiritually blind. They're going to act like people who are spiritually blind. We are spiritually alive. The blinders have been taken off of our eyes. We can see spiritual things because of Jesus that now lives within us. And because of those blinders that have been removed, we can see spiritual things. We expect the whole world to see spiritual things. You'll find yourself saying, I just can't believe they don't see that. I just can't believe they believe that way. I just can't believe they don't see it. It's right before their eyes. All this is going on. It's because they're spiritually blind. Now, if you're out there listening in your spiritual mind, guess what? God can remove those blinders tonight, amen? Salvation can come in your life and Jesus can change you, amen? But anyway, the world doesn't know or understand believers. And we don't need to expect them to understand us or, or understand us or, because they're spiritually blind, amen? Now, Matthew 10, 17 says, but beware of men for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Matthew 24, 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I'm gonna tell you, if anybody promised you that Christianity was gonna be a rose garden, I'm gonna tell you, you heard that old song, I never promised you a rose garden. We've had it mighty good here in the United States. We've been blessed. God has blessed us. And we've not been persecuted or prosecuted because of our Christianity. But folks, I want to tell you, the world's getting darker and darker and darker every day. Jesus' is coming is closer and closer and closer every day. And if his coming is, is prolonged, there will be a time, my friend, even in these United States of America, the Bible is not a lie. Hey, Amen. It's truth. It's pure truth. The Bible tells us that that we will, there will come a time where it will even cost us our lives to be a Christian. You say, preacher, I don't like the way that sounds. Well, I'm gonna tell you what. There's coming a time if God prolongs his coming and if you live long enough, you'll see that's already happening in other places, amen. 
It's already happening in other places in the world. Missionaries being killed every day. People in other countries who profess to be Christians are, are being killed every day. God has just blessed us here in America. Hey man, we need to have revival here in America. We need to, we need to be a second Chronicle 714 America. We need to get on our knees before the Lord. We need to repent of our sins and the Lord will hear, hear our prayers and he'll, he'll forgive our sins and he'll heal our lands. But it starts in the house of the Lord. It doesn't start with the unbelievers. Revival always starts with God's people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ooh, our time is getting close. I've just got through with verse one. Verse two. Now verse two is talking about the return of Jesus Christ. I get excited. Well, I get excited when we talk about the return of Jesus. Let's read it again. Beloved, now we are children of God. Who I'm gonna shout right there when we get back to it in just a minute. And it has not been yet revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, Jesus, we shall be like Jesus, for we shall see Jesus as Jesus is. I want you to know this verse is talking about the final transformation of the believer. But before we get to that, I want to get you excited because the beginning of verse 2 says, Beloved, one day we're going to become the children of God. No, that's not what he said. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I told you you'd get excited here. I'm reading from the New King James. I don't know what your version says, but mine says, Beloved, N-O-W. Now we are children of God. Not one day you're going to be a child of God. My friend, the Bible clearly states that we are children of God right now. Your eternal life started the day you got saved. You don't have to wait till you lay, lay this old body down and take the last breath down here to receive that. My God bless you. Hey, man, we have eternal life right now. We're living in it right now. It started the day we were saved. I'm a child of God the moment I asked Jesus to come into my heart and save me. Amen. We are his child now. You say, what's they got to do with anything? Start living like it, amen. Start living like the child of God that he says you are. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to the devil try to, try to get you down and out. You're a child of the king, amen. You're a child of the king. He's gonna talk about that in verse, in verse three. He's going to talk. I don't know if we'll get that far. I sure hope to, but I guess we probably won't. But anyway, now we are children of God. Now it says here, we, but we know that when he is revealed, we are children of God and it's not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes or you take your last breath here, whichever comes first, kind of like a warranty on a car, right? Any of you ever had a new car? I think I've had two new vehicles in my entire life. First one was a truck and the second one was a car. We don't have either one of those. The first one tore up. The third day we had it. It cost us the life of one of our children. Sad, sad story. We, we got rid of it. And the second one, we, we gave it to Sarah when she graduated, the Toyota. But anyway, when you buy a new car and you look at the warranty, it'll say three years or 36,000 miles, depending on what you buy. You may get one that says 10 years or 100,000 miles. That's a good one. But here's the way, here's, here's what I'm talking about here. Either by rapture or when you breathe your last breath here, you're going to get a new body. Hey Amen. That's what this says. Because we're children of God, 
it hadn't been revealed yet what we're going to be. He says, he's talking about that either by rapture or about when we lay, lay this body down here. Says, we're not there yet. I'm still in the flesh. You're still in the flesh. Now, we can live a spiritual life. We can walk on the clouds, amen, praise God. We can, we can rest in the bosom of Abraham. We can, we can walk with Jesus even now like Adam and Eve did in the garden in the very beginning. I believe we can accomplish that in, in, the, in this present state. But we still have diseases and we still have problems within this old flesh. We have pains and ailments and we fall and we break things and, and, and our cells don't reproduce as we get older like they did when they were younger and we start having wrinkles and, and, and we don't look as good as we used to and our hair turns gray or turns loose one or the other. Like Johnny Deer, his hair turned loose. But I'm gonna tell you something. One day, all that's gonna change. One day we're gonna be transformed and we're gonna have a new body. You say, what kind of body we're gonna have? Well, I'm gonna tell you what this verse right here says. What does it say? It has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, Jesus is revealed, when Jesus comes back, or either we meet him through death, it says right here, what does it say? We shall be what? Like him. You're gonna be like Jesus. That's kind of hard to comprehend. But that's exactly what the Bible says. We shall be like him. And then he goes on to say, for we shall see him as he is. Let me tell you something. There's never been a person in the flesh who has seen Jesus as he is and lived to tell about it. Now Moses, we know, saw the backside of God, amen. But God told Moses, remember what he told him? He says, Moses, I know you want to see me face to face, but he says, that's not possible and you live. Man cannot do that. Let me tell you something. In our new body, we're going to be able to be, we'll be just like Jesus and we will see him as he is. You think he was something when he was here on earth? Let me tell you something. You ain't seen nothing yet. It's bad English, but it's good sense. You ain't seen nothing yet. Hey, man, think about it. You say, well, what's the difference? The Bible says Jesus is light and in him there is no what? What does it say? There is no darkness. In him is light and there is no darkness. You're gonna be like him. That means you're gonna be light and there will be no darkness within you. Man, that's exciting. Our time is up. I sure wanted to get to, I sure, well, let's go ahead with verse three. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Because you are, Because the love of God has been bestowed upon us and we are his children, and because we're going to be like Jesus and see him as he is, he says in verse three, then you need to live like it. That's what verse three means. Then you need to act like it. You need to live like it. You need to walk like it. You need to talk like it. You need to dress like it. Come on, preach a little bit now, amen. We need to act like who we are and that is the children of God, amen. He says here in verse three, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Purifies himself just as he, talking about Jesus, is pure. Remember Paul says we are to have the mind of Christ. We are to have the mind of Christ. How does a person walk? talk and live, purifies himself like verse three, it starts in the mind. It starts in the mind. The mind is the spiritual warfare. That's where that's the spiritual battlefield. Our mind, we have to train ourselves, our thoughts. We have to take them under subjection. The Bible talks about all that. Paul teaches all this. And we have to renew our mind daily, Paul says. Daily is a daily thing. That renewing he's talking about is like 
washing a dirty set of clothes. Now, I don't mean where we, you think about it, you wear clothes today, you may get them a little sold, and guess what? You go home, you put them in the washing machine, or used to, you'd wash them on a rub board. I know some of you probably have done that before. You're old enough to have done that. Rub, rub on a rub board and wash your clothes. That's what he's referring to. He's referring to, now you say, well, you mean I get sold? Yes, and you know why we get sold? Because we're in the world. We go out here in the world, and the world rubs, we rub shoulders with the world. Amen? We can't stay at home and say, I'm holier than everybody else. I need to live a holy life, so I'm just gonna stay away from everybody. No, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you're the light of the world now that I'm gone. He was the light, but now you're the light. And he says, you need to go out and be the light. So we have to get out in the world of darkness, rub shoulders with the world, and what happens is we hear things, we see things, things are said to us, and there's that mind warfare. Then we have to come back, and we have to take all of that like the washboard, and we have to wash all that away, renew that mind daily, as Paul says. Renew it daily, get rid of that, come back to spiritual thinking. Hey, man, come back to spiritual thinking. I'm a child of God. Amen. That's how you overcome that. All right. Well, we got through verse three. A lot of stuff here. A lot of good stuff. Anytime you talk about the love of God, it's good stuff. Now, Brother Donnie, he had to leave, so I'm going to run back here, and I'm going to switch this off. So you folks who are watching by via the Internet, God bless you for watching. I'm going to run back here, and you're not going to see me, but this thing's going to go dark here in just a minute. Goodbye.